the new economy is something that we can start living today. We don't have to wait for the money system to change. And in fact, by living it today, we induce a change in the money system by orienting ourselves toward the gift we're practicing for what's coming in the future and actually creating the kind of security that people crave with all of their investments and wealth getting. I spoke um, to an investors group last year and the speaker before me was talking about the collapse of the financial system and he said really the only safe investment is physical gold because he said, you know, money, paper money, electronic money, that's just convention. That's just agreement. That'll evaporate. That'll become worthless. Hyperinflation is going to set in. And, and, and this, he didn't use the word story, but this, you know, the agreements that give it value will fall apart. So invest in physical gold. And so I spoke after that, and someone asked me, well, what do you think about gold? And I said, that's the worst possible investment you can make. Because if things fall apart to that extent, and you have gold, men with guns will come and take your gold. <laughs> so what would be a better investment if you want security? <laughs> the best investment would be to be a big giver, to give as much as possible to your community. And, to, and not only to give money to your community, but to but to develop skills and orient your life with the intention of being able to provide things that people need, then you will become valuable. You will generate gratitude and you'll become necessary. And when the world falls apart, you will still have wealth. And I thought, you know, so, so what we give, in other words, what we give can survive the transition between worlds. And I think that this is true of the other big transition between worlds that happens when we die. I imagine myself lying on my deathbed and all of the things that I've accumulated and built, I can't take those with me. Those are all gonna be gone. Just like financial investments and bank accounts will be gone <coughs> if the money system collapses and if there's hyperinflation. I can't take those with me. The material things I've accumulated, even the immaterial things, the status, the reputation, all the people who think well of me, like that stuff all perishes. But what will give me joy in those moments? And it'll be all the things that I've given to the world. And those things will persist after I'm gone. Those are the things that survive the transition between worlds. And all of a sudden then I understood this, these spiritual teachings, this, these biblical teachings even, that what you give, you, you receive. Yeah. And so there's this unity between giving and receiving that I talked about last night also, um, that to fully receive is an act of generosity and to fully give is an act of self-care and self-nurture. And this is something that we can feel the truth of. So I think, well, there's more, but um, I think the biggest thing is to prepare and to enter the new state of human beingness, the connected self, living in co-creative partnership with Earth, desiring to give back, to give to other beings, and to live in the gift. Um, I think that this is really the essence of sacred economics. And it's something that we want to do anyway. Up until today, the structures of society have resisted this desire. But as the big stories of the people fall apart, the structures that are built on top of them are falling apart also. And other people's opinions, social pressures, practicality, 
will soon no longer become, no longer be the enemies of our desire to live in the gift. We live in really special times. A process of separation thousands of years in the making is culminating today. The crises that are converging upon us are really good news. They mark the end of an era. They are the transition, the, the ordeal that propels us as a species into adulthood. And these species-wide crises, these planetary crises, echo into our personal lives. The dissolution of community echoes into our lives as, as relationship crises and divorce. The depletion of nature that echoes into our lives as bankruptcy. Um, the destruction of the ecosystem also echoes into our lives as, as various health crises. All of these things help us transition. These are our personal ordeals that, that transition us that, that into a connected state of being or a close brush with death, which is also something human beings are now encountering as we, we see that the effects of our actions may make human life on earth <coughs> impossible because of climate change maybe. We could start a new ice age or we could deplete the biosphere so much that, that we go extinct. So humanity's having a close brush with death right now. And we can see on a personal level what a close brush with death does. Either your own or someone you love dies. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're sitting by that dying person and the truth of the self of inner beingness and the truth of the purpose is here. Your purpose here is to love, to give. Love is the feeling of, of the connected self. Because when you love somebody, they're not an other anymore. Like the self-interest includes the family even for, for pretty much everybody. We don't compete so much financially you know, in our families. When we talk about my interests, I include my children's interests. So love expands the self. And this truth this is, is made very apparent when, when we face death illness, or any of these other crises. We, you know, it's, it's, it's very mundane knowledge. You learn what's important in life. You come back to the truth. That's what happens on the individual level. That's what's happening on the species level. And the two are related because the species-wide crises are causing lots of individual crises. So we're, we're at a very special moment in human history, which is why there are seven billion of us all gathered at the same time. Sometimes I think that every human being who's ever lived is now incarnated here for the big party, for the big transition. And one more thing. Every person has a unique and necessary role to play in this transition. That's why you're here. Maybe you don't know what it is yet, but as the crisis progresses, as the crisis progresses, that and the needs grow, that gift will be called forth from you. So it's okay to wait for that to happen and to be secure in the knowledge that you're here for a reason. Okay. I guess I'm, I would like to um, invite questions, comments. Yeah. So if, if you could use the microphone, please, because it is being recorded. <coughs> uh, thank you. I agree with almost everything I've uh, heard you say this evening. I certainly have felt uh, for quite some time exactly what you described. <coughs> what I'm a little bit unclear about, though, is I do have a, uh, 
a different opinion in one of your basic assertions. I, I just view money as a store of value and that that's really all it is. It seems like what you're really talking about is, is our culture of consumption and, and, okay. and basically the, the, uh, the triumph of marketing, that everything we need is outside of ourselves. Money, the draw for money is not in and of itself, at least in my view, the draw in money, the attraction in money is what it can buy you or me. And so it seems like really what you're talking about is, is our consumption model and what we need being outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not loved right. because we don't use the right toothpaste. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay. There's a couple ways to approach this. Remember at the beginning I said money, like the Tao, uh, all things come from it, all things return to it. With money, you can buy anything. And anything you can, again, sell and get money again. Well, I'm just going to leave that thought there and now say that this, this dynamic of, of this business model of take something away from somebody and sell it back to them. The things that have been taken away from us create this culture of consumerism that you're, that you're talking about. Um, is it the secure person or the insecure person who desires to buy 50 pairs of shoes? Um, who wants to always go shopping all the time, who wants more and more and more. The person who's actually living in abundance isn't going to be greedy, isn't going to want to accumulate. What's happened is that, that the, and this goes really deep, the ideology of separation, the experience of being a separate self, disconnected from other people, disconnected from nature, from community, that cut off creates a deficit of being. We feel like we barely even exist. Um, we're cut off from most of what we are. We've, we, we are, in fact, infinite beings. Everybody in this room is part of me. Every being in the universe is part of me. Pre-industrial people, especially pre-agricultural people, experienced this as a living reality. This connected nature of the self, this, this interbeingness. When we've been cut off from that and made tiny, we desire to recover our lost connections. We have a hunger to expand back into our true vastness. And one of the symptoms of this hunger is consumerism. The idea is to compensate for the cutoff from our infinity, we add as much as possible to our finite self and get bloated. I think that the obesity epidemic is also part of this. It's the expansion of a part of us to make up for the loss of the whole. And so one way that, that another way to put it then is that, the, um, that consumerism comes from the felt experience of scarcity. Scarcity is caused by the money system. We live in a world of abundance. Like there's no reason why half the world overeats while the other half goes hungry. There's no reason why, why Half the world has closets and closets and closets full of clothes, and other people go naked. There's no, the only reason is, is, that, is the stories that determine how these things are distributed. It's the story of money that causes so much wealth to accumulate and glut in some parts of the meta-human body and other parts to be starving for nourishment. Um, so we live in a world of fundamental abundance. But we've created artificial scarcity. This artificial scarcity drives a hunger to consume. And then we go and blame people for being so greedy and so consumptive and say, you know, you should, you should hold back. You should, you should control this bad desire that you have, this greediness that you have. And, and a good person is somebody who makes do with less and controls this profligate, wanton greed and by doing that, we exacerbate the war against the self that is the interior reflection of the war against nature and actually intensify this cutoff. Because how does somebody feel when they get that kind of blame and judgment leveled at them? 
They feel even more insecure, more scarce, and they're going to make it up to themselves by going and buying a BMW or something. So um, I, I don't think that money is just something neutral that we have. Some people say, oh, money is just energy. But it's energy with a very particular flavor. Because of the way it's created, it embodies all of these stories. Uh, and that's why, on some level, it is true that when we enter into a mindset of abundance, we will experience external abundance. And a lot of New Age teachers will say that. You know, you get into the, the mentality of gratitude and generosity and abundance, and money will come to you. And, they, and sometimes, though, they imply that if everybody did that, then everybody would have monetary abundance. And we don't need to change the money system at all. But actually, what would happen if everybody entered that, that mindset, the money system would change. Because the money system today embodies and reinforces scarcity. So hopefully that somehow covered your question. Um, but if you, but I'll um, ask, I'll invite another question. But if, if, you, if you think about it and you're not satisfied, then feel free to ask again. OK. That's really the fulcrum. Yeah. I, I took a nine month road trip, packed everything I needed in my little old truck. And during that road trip, I realized what little I needed. Yeah. That was my fulcrum. So realizing that, the story of money went away from me. Yeah. So it was no longer buying the money, it was the consumption part. Yeah. Part of it. That was the driving thing, at least in my yeah. experience. Yeah, I don't think that money is the deepest root of the world around us the, that we've created. It's pretty deep, though. You know, you go and ask why, um, why are children working in factories in Pakistan? Why have we? Why are we poisoning the coral reefs? Why? 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 You know, and a couple whys down, you always get to money, and then, well. Maybe it's greed. That's, that was one, you know, that tortured me. I'm like, people are just greedy. There's something bad. There's something wrong about human beings that we have to conquer. Not realizing that this desire to conquer this bad thing is the same thought form as the, 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 the story of ascent to conquer nature, to conquer the weeds, to conquer the bad insects, to conquer the germs, to become the lords and masters of nature, to become the lords and masters of ourselves, of our biology, to transcend that into the realm of mind, into the realm of will, to the realm of spirit, to something non-material. Like it's all part of, this, part of the same mind form. So, so you're right, money, money's not the deepest root, but it's deeply implicated. And it's a good entree into the deeper things too. Yeah. most is the richest and the most pure. Yeah. So in a new in the new story, do um, do we go to a place where we again are uh, living in smaller communities and not really traveling, and do, or does that somehow what we're used to now with so much movement does that somehow get incorporated into the way? Um. Well, there's a lot of things about that. Um, I think that the economy will become a lot more local. Not necessarily as a matter of necessity, as much as a matter of choice. The things of the commodity world that we use to, to, to meet our needs only meet very certain of our needs and leave a lot of needs unmet. So for example, commodity food can meet our need for calories, for certain levels of vitamins. that can meet our need for the measurable things. But they can't meet our need for beautiful food given to us by someone who loves us or someone who knows our story. And these are important needs. Like the need, we need stories. We need to be known. We need to be 
enmeshed in a web of relationship. And material things can be part of the transmission of these stories and of these relationships. I think the other night I mentioned, you know, grandma's China, you know, like to, to use that China, it doesn't meet any measurable need like any plate would do to satisfy the, your, your bodily need for, for, to, to make food and stuff. But grandma's China or, or, or the China that has some story attached to it involves you in a web of relationship that meets needs that cannot be measured. And what's happened, it's related to what I was talking about before, when, when these needs go unmet, when the things that, that come into our lives are bereft of any stories, they're just commodities, they're standardized, they're made by anonymous strangers in distant lands, then we have these serious unmet needs. And we then have no way to meet these needs, so we buy more and more stuff as a substitute for what we really want. What we really want is to be connected. But there's all of the avenues for connection have been cut off, so instead we buy stuff, or we eat stuff, or we have these other addictions as substitutes for what we really need. Uh, I mean, I could talk a lot more about, I mean, a lot of my book, or parts of my book, is, is about how to redesign money so that it um, internalizes costs so that you can no longer profit by passing the costs on to future generations or onto the ecosystem. Um, and so I think part of that will make, will make long distance travel a lot more expensive because it'll reflect its true costs. That said, we are also going to experience more and more new realms of abundance. The digital economy is part of that. Things that, like digital content now, is becoming abundant in the sense that the marginal cost of production is zero. Like, I can put this video on, online, and the cost for me to do that is the same whether one person downloads it or a million people download it. There's no production cost, so it's fundamentally abundant. I can give it away, and I still have as much as I had before. So money in a, system, in a, in a, in a um, environment of abundance looks very different. And so this is just like the first step in our emergence into abundance. And I think that someday, I don't know in my lifetime or not, but someday we will have the same abundance with, with energy as we have with information. <clears throat> and this is getting into territory that would torpedo my credibility as a responsible thinker. But <laughs> I mean, you know, look at a copy of Infinite Energy magazine. There are somewhere between 10 and 20 technologies that can produce limitless amounts of energy without any conventional fuel source. Um, Tesla invented the first one that I know about. He, this is an interesting story. He, um, so first, he, he invents all kinds of stuff that you can make lots of money on, such as AC current. And you can have a big power station and run wires to people's houses and put a meter there and charge them. The more they use, the more they have to pay you. So the industrialists loved him and embraced his inventions and, and venerated him as a genius. So then what does he do? He gets lots of funding from JP Morgan for his big new project, and he builds this gigantic transmission station. He's got a ship out in the ocean, and he's invented wireless transmission of power that is essentially unlimited once it reaches a certain scale. And the recipient can draw as much as he wants, and there's no way to tell how much he's drawing. So JP Morgan finds out about Tesla's impending success. He's going to try it out soon, and he pulls the plug on the project, cuts off all funding. And he doesn't say, Tesla has gone crazy. This can't possibly work. He doesn't say, this violates the laws of physics. He says, if I can't meter it, I can't sell it. So essentially, we were still in, so his mindset of scarcity 
which was a product of the money system, essentially cut off infinite abundance for humanity. And as we step into an attitude of abundance and begin to live it, then the um, manifestation of that abundance will come into our experience. And when we take enough steps into this abundance, we will have energy abundance um, that boggles the mind. In a way, though, J.P. Morgan did us a favor because maybe we weren't ready for it, you know? Like, what would have happened? I mean, the next huge energy source that we discovered was atomic power. And what was the first thing we did with it? You know? So, so maybe there was, um, you know, we weren't ready for it. And, and I think that this process of separation, I've said this the other evenings, you know, it has, it's a story. A story has its beginning, its middle, and its end. It has its telling. And only when it reaches the end of its telling is it ready to give way to the next story. And it hadn't, in 1913, it hadn't finished its telling yet. But today, it's reaching its end. Yeah. I, I was uh, intrigued when you, thank you. I was intrigued when you uh, used the metaphor of the body. Um, and it's like the body doesn't save anything. It, it's like if I want to run up a hill, I don't like save so many gallons of air and then say, okay, now I can use it. I, I run up the hill and then the air, uh, without my even having to ask, it's, mm -hmm. it, it serves me. So I'm wondering, how, what is the relationship between, the, what's the metaphor between how the body works and how the larger body would work? I just yeah. to say more about that. Um, there's a lot of ways I could approach that. Um, money, for example, is analogous to the signaling molecules in a body that say such and such a resource is needed here. And some people say, you know, why do we even need money at all, Charles? Why even have money? Why not just everyone just give, you know, and receive? And, and why try to keep track of everything with money? Um, and the answer lies in, you know, in, in, in early societies when the scale of society was no more than 500 people, all giving happened in a social witnessing. Everybody knew who was being generous, who wasn't. Everybody knew who needed what because stories would circulate and everybody had, everybody knew everybody's story. But in a mass society, with millions of people, we don't all know each other's stories, so there has to be some other way to signal where needs need to go. So I imagine the engineer in Finland, you know, he could spend all day in solving Sudoku puzzles, or, and that would be fun and interesting for him, or he could spend all day designing circuits for cell phones. And so in its um, sacred aspect, money is the signal that says, Mr. Engineer, we would like you to design cell phones and not spend all your time doing Sudoku puzzles. So it's a signaling of a need. Um, so that's one metaphor. Um, another is that money is like blood that sends nourishment to all of the different cells and that financial institutions, the central bank is like the heart. Now the old paradigm says the heart pumps the blood but the actual accurate understanding of the heart is that the heart receives the blood, listens to the blood, and sends it back out again. The heart is a listening organ. Um, so there's a whole, I, I can elaborate that metaphor a lot. Um, but what I really see, where I see the economy going is, is, and this is related to the role of humanity on earth, our, our true purpose. I see that the economy is going to become an extension of the ecology. The industrial system, the system of human production is going to become an extension of the ecology and obey all of the rules of the ecology, foremost of which is that waste is food. In an ecology, any waste product that any plant or animal produces is food for some, is, is used by, for, by some other creature. Our economy today is not like that. We produce things such as, uh, plutonium and dioxin and 
um, PCBs that are not useful for any other life process. That's going to stop. And we're going to become an extension of the ecology and a way that Gaia is itself growing and developing, adding new dimensions of complexity, growing, growing the ecosystem, essentially. Um, we are a new organ of Gaia that's growing, sprouting. And there's, so that's another idea to play with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the thing with your, your idea that you know, money is a story and you know, our economy is a story, I just wonder, do you, do you think that we need a, a new story that, you know, sort of one size fits all of a planetary story culture? Or, for example, uh, like the story of the Amish. You know, I mean, they have sort of an economy that is mm. probably more sustainable than the way, you know, a majority of us live. And, you know, so basically my question is, do we need lots of separate stories for, you know, separate regions? You know, yeah. I mean, if you live, if you live in, in the desert, I mean, the, the, the value of a gallon of water is yeah. a lot more. Absolutely. Um, yeah, this is a, a, a chapter or a part of the book that I didn't speak on, but um, I think that uh, economies and political divisions will become much more bioregional, and that money will be, one of the proposals I have is that money will be backed by the commons and by natural resources, by the things that we are becoming sacred to us. Whatever money is, boy, this is going to be a long answer. Um, in, in short, yes. Um, uh, and and I'm, I, I see it as stories within stories within stories, and, and, and stories that are connected to other stories and that have common, common ground and, and, and there's cultural differences and, and all being embedded in the, the meta story of the connected self, of inner beingness living in co-creative partnership with Earth. That's the big story that kind of contains many, many different expressions of that story, each unique to its own bioregion and its own culture. Um, so one practical, specific idea that I work with in this line is, see, whatever money is or is backed by becomes sacred. When money was gold or backed by gold, gold became sacred. People didn't say it was sacred, but they treated it as this special thing that was highly coveted and, and, and protected. And they went to any length to dig it out of the ground. This useless metal, they spend, and it's very ecologically destructive too, to dig out gold and to refine it with mercury, you know. And, to, and then what do you do when you finally get it out of the ground? You put it back in the ground in something called a vault. It is <laughs> utterly insane. It's just, in societies where, where cattle are money, then people keep herds much bigger than they actually need. They, they have some for meat and milk, but they have the rest because it's money. So I thought, okay, if whatever money is becomes sacred and we get more and more of it, what happens if we use undeveloped wetlands, unpumped oil, unpolluted skies, unmonetized relationships? What if we use those as money? then those will become sacred to us and we'll have more and more of those. So essentially, so for example, you back money with groundwater. And, and so each dollar represents a certain amount of groundwater. And if you want to pump the groundwater, you have to redeem that dollar for groundwater to say irrigate your crops. So now you'll have a financial incentive to conserve water. You'll have a financial incentive to use less oil, financial incentive to reduce your pollution. Um, and this, because these commons, um, these things that are becoming sacred to us, many of them are local or regional in nature, um, a lot of money will be local or regional in nature, issued by local and regional governments, and therefore political power will become more local also. So, that's a lot of uh, conceptualization packed into one minute. And for me, it's, it flows pretty easily because I've been thinking about this almost nonstop for years. But, 
but um, I'll, I'll put it out there and in the sacred economics book it explains it more but I hope at least there's a you know a spark of, of something for you all yeah I was wondering if you uh, see I haven't read your book <laughs> but if you see some sort of uh, uh, catalyst that will allow us to go from where we are to uh, giving yeah you know for me the catalyst was that the other way didn't work anymore. You know, like I tried to be, you know, like a hot shit author, you know, and a big success and everything and promote myself. I mean, my heart wasn't really in it. You know, I didn't do a very good job of it. I couldn't motivate myself to do it. I kind of went through the motions, you know, but I mean, I kind of tried and it, it so didn't work. And it didn't feel right, you know, and eventually everything fell apart. And I think that, in general, very few people change their lives in any meaningful way until the old life falls apart, until the old story ends, until there's some kind of crisis. So I think that is what it's going to take to enter the gift. Yeah. I think this is along the same lines. Uh, how is this going to happen, given the fact that the old story and backed up by lots of people, we call them the ruling classroom, yeah. with armies and weapons, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they'll, they try to sustain it as long as they can, just like an addict tries to sustain the addiction as long as possible. But it's fundamentally unsustainable. It's mathematically impossible to keep the debt growing exponentially forever. It has, it's, it's mathematically impossible to keep pumping more and more oil forever to keep converting more and more of the ecosystem. We can't do it. It's impossible. It has to fall apart. It's just a matter of when. And this is actually really important, this matter of when, because there's a lot we can do to make the collapse happen faster. And <laughs> and to mitigate its severity. Because if the Tao Tia if this monster needs to grow and grow and grow, eat and eat and eat or die, any food that you take away from it will shorten its lifespan. Any road that you stop, any forest that you make off limits, any land that you save from development, any fishery that you preserve, any, anything, any culture that you that you say that you um, protect from globalization and monetization reduces the amount of food available to the beast and shortens its lifespan. It makes, it makes the growth process end sooner. And then all of this wealth is still there after the collapse happens. And we need some of this wealth in order to rebuild a different kind of society. So all of these efforts are super important that, that we're doing to preserve something of the common wealth that was our endowment. Yeah. Yes. I'd like you to speak a little bit about what's happening in Cancun with carbon credits, rent, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, The, the idea of carbon credits is similar to what I was talking about with you know, backing money with the commons and stuff, but just the way that they're implemented has had huge problems. And, um, but it worked really well with sulfur dioxide. Um, this same kind of cap and trade system worked pretty well. So I think it's fundamentally in the right direction, but it's just like everything else, you, know, you have this idea that's, that's, that's fundamentally right, and then it can be applied in ways that are totally wrong and end up having no effect, but it is the right idea, I think. You know, we have, to, we have to internalize costs. We have to make the cost of production reflect the pollution that it causes, so that things that make more pollution are more expensive. And then the best business decision comes into alignment with the best ecological decision. Yeah. It's being abused so much, too. Right, yeah. 
Yes. Why do you use the Tower of Babel as the symbol? Ooh, I love that question. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to hold it up and so people can see this picture? Yeah, the uh, Tower of ba Babel um, on the cover of the book. Well, it's, it's, an, it's an embodiment of the story of ascent that says that when we have enough inventions, when we solve enough problems, when we have enough control, when, when we build high enough, we will reach paradise. And we've built really high already, and we're almost there, a few more levels. Nanotechnology, genetic engineering, uh, and um, computer science, you know, and then, and then we'll have a perfect society. We'll have our infinite lifespans, we'll have We'll, have, uh, we'll engineer the pleasure centers of the, of the brain so that people will be in pleasure all the time. Um, <laughs> we will create wondrous artificial environments, virtual environments, right? This, this idea of, of constant improvement to reach paradise. Uh, on the personal level, it's the same. I just have a few problems and I've got to improve myself and get control of myself and, and, and build this tower of self a little higher and then everything will be perfect. Generally, it is the attempt to attain the infinite through finite means. That's what the metaphor is, to build a tower to heaven all the way to the sky. Well, at some point, you, so you, you put more and more effort into building the tower, and, and for a while, it grows fast. Um, and, and, and it seemed like we were getting closer and closer to the sky at a rapid clip in the early 20th century. All of the big diseases got conquered. And we had big improvements in every area, or so it seemed. And people thought, yeah, by the year 2000, we'll have our space colonies, our flying cars, no disease, 200-year lifespans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it seemed like the tower was. But then, as it gets higher and higher, all kinds of problems start to happen. For one thing, it, it takes a lot of effort to get the stone all the way up there. And then the base begins to crumble, and you have to keep repairing it. You know, So you have, in the first half of the century, Lifespans in America went up by 26 years with very, very little investment, tiny investments. In the last 50 years, or in the second half of the 20th century, lifespans only went up by nine years. Most of that because of lower infant mortality. The average life expectancy of a 25-year-old went up barely at all. But does that, is that because we didn't invest as much effort in it? No. We invested huge, I mean, come on, medical healthcare spending now is, is astronomical. And people are getting less healthy. Eventually, when the tower gets so high, eventually you have to devote all your efforts even to keeping it at the same level that it was. It's just like an addiction, and it's the same mentality. You know, you have your first, your first fix, your first, well, it's not a fix at the beginning. At the beginning, it makes you high. And you think, great, if I can just stay high all the time. I'm going to build my whole life around maintaining this addiction. I'm going to feel great all the time. But eventually, more and more effort is required to maintain the addiction. To even stay normal, to even keep the tower this high, requires more and more effort. And it becomes a fix. What once made you high now just maintains normal. Same thing with agricultural chemicals. First, you get big improvements in the yield. Eventually, you have to put more and more and more chemical inputs in to even maintain yields. Then eventually they drop down to where they were to begin with and you're totally dependent on it. So the same dynamic everywhere. So eventually you get exhausted. You can't maintain the tower anymore. And you're like, oh, I can't do it anymore. And you look around you. You realize that you're no closer to the sky than when you began. And then you realize that the sky begins an inch off the ground, that paradise isn't something that you have to exert great efforts to achieve. It's already there, closer than close. It's always been there. Hunter-gatherers had all of the things that we pursue. Abundance, leisure, connection, 
all the things that we crave were already there without all this effort. And so, with that realization, we don't stop building. But no longer do we build for height. We build for beauty. I think we're probably way over time. Do we have? Yeah. OK. Um, well, yeah, you and, and you, two more people. And then we'll see how it goes. I know it's um, getting away to way past mm -hmm. any sensible person's time to be up. However, you're talking about stories. And um, it's such a wonderful story that you're sharing. And as that tower gets built, another part of the story is the confusion that ensues mm -hmm. from the building of it until people can no longer understand one another. And it appears that this is where really where we are, is we do not understand one another. And possibly it's really because there are so many stories we've forgotten how to listen. And so learning to listen is really a simple and a very first step again. And so it's a pleasure to be able to be here and attempting to learn to listen to so much of everything that you share. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, all this stuff about the connected self can sound somewhat theoretical. Everybody agrees with it in principle as an intellectual idea. But it's rare moments that we actually experience it as a, as a living experience. But one way to step into this connected self is through the primal gift that any human being has to offer any other being, which is the gift of attention. And, and when you talk about listening, it's, that's a kind of attention that makes us one and gives us that experience, as we all felt just now. So thank you. After this last comment, I do have uh, I need two minutes of your time before you get up to leave, so if you please just stay seated until I just speak for about <coughs> minutes. So, um, I'm just going to tower. It leads us outside of ourselves and the story of the tower was about a greed and about going beyond creation itself and lacked love. So what is the impact of love in connectedness within ourselves and others to reverse the motion of building of this irresistible desire that our modern societies have to build these towers and 
we do it ourselves almost all the time. <clears throat> well, that um, irresistible greed that you talk about as the motive for tower building is based on separation and a lack of love. And as we explore and complete the journey of separation and come back to love, no longer do we feel this irresistible greed. It's not that we've conquered it. It's that it becomes irrelevant. But you know what? That whole journey of separation, this whole episode of building a really high tower, that wasn't a big mistake. It's part of a process. We learned tower building doing that. <laughs> we learned how to build, we, we, we developed capacities that can be turned to really beautiful purposes. The same technologies that created the machine gun and the atom bomb and the guillotine also created the symphony orchestra and the Chartres Cathedral and many other beautiful things. So we've developed a lot of, of skills and enriched ourselves through this journey and, and acquired many, many beautiful stories. So I'm glad that the journey of separation is, has turned and is coming back toward reunion. Um, but I'm also thankful for all of those beings who went on this journey, all of my ancestors who walked these paths, including the people who perpetrated the worst of the horrors and went on the longest journeys of separation. They did their part in completing the story, in, in the enactment of this story. I talked about that last night, and you can, you'll be able to see it by video sometime, because my voice is getting tired. Um, but I really want to thank you all for sharing these moments of connection and truth and and um, and just for for listening and sharing.